dreams come true. That's the exit 209 off of I-40 in Nashville. And virtually everybody who's sought the dream in Music City for one reason or another has made that first exit off of exit 209. And we're going to get there with our guest, Carrie Underwood, 70 million albums, eight studio albums, six world tours, solo I mean, headlining tours, 100 plus major awards, including seven Grammys. So, yes, the exit was a good choice uh, when you finally <laughs> got to keep driving. <laughs> Don't keep driving. Thanks for being here, Carrie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You've been a friend for a long time, and uh, there, there's a lot I know about you, and there's a lot I don't know about you. So we're going to try to get to uh, some of those things. And we start, as always, on this journey to Exit 209 with the beginning. And I, I would love for you to paint a picture. If I were to drive into Shakota, Oklahoma for the first time, what does it look like? Oh, golly. Um, a lot of uh, kind of older buildings. Um it's just it's kind of looked the same for a very long time. My my husband kind of describes it like it's like you're it's like you're taking a step back in time, you know, because there's not there's a lot of short buildings, not a lot of like two story, three story things. Uh, no high rises. No, no. Uh, I don't know. It's just it's kind of a small farm town. Stoplights. You know? Uh, there are there was one forever and that was it in the main center of town you go to the go to the stoplight you take a left you know that's how you <laughs> gave directions to people um but now we we got a new Walmart a few years ago and uh there has been since there's more like truck traffic over by there um people come to our Walmart from from all around because it's a lot of just small, a lot of small towns that aren't too far away from each other. Any you, you drive 15 minutes any any one direction, you're in another town. Right. And uh, yeah, so they'll come to us. So now I think we are we're up to like three or four stoplights. Gosh, booming metropolis. No, there's the one in the middle of town, and then all the rest are over by Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> you were born actually in Muskogee, but uh, the your parents' farm is in Chicago, right? Yeah, Muskogee was the closest uh, hospital. It's about eh, 25 minutes away. That's a long way for a hospital, but that's I also it's, it's Oklahoma, we'll though. See, but now, I mean, I live in, you know, I live in Franklin <laughs> and everything's like 30 minutes away, no matter what it is. So you, know, you go to the grocery store, it's like 25, 25, 30 minutes away. Everything is <laughs> it's true. Youngest of three sisters um, growing up uh, again with the painting of the picture. What, what is the house? What is the house? What is the family dynamic? What is uh, the <laughs> environment like there? Um, golly. I mean, we lived, we lived out in the country. So the town is the country, but then we lived in the country of the country. <laughs> and uh, my sisters are a little bit older than me. So they, they kind of had their family unit established before I got there. Um, and I was the surprise of, of the family. Um, so my sisters are like 10 and 13 years older than me. So I, I don't, I don't remember a whole lot of my oldest sister us all being in the same house together. Um, but they, you know, went to college and I feel like it, it made me have a, a very close relationship with my mom, which yeah. now, you know, I feel like now I'm, I work, me and my sisters are a little more on the same wavelength, you know, we all have kids and we can relate to each other more now than we could when, you know, I was, I was little and, um, or even, even in my twenties. Um, but yeah, I have a really close relationship with my mom and they still live in that, uh, the house I grew up in. So they what's the age live. difference between uh, the sisters? Uh, they are three years apart and I'm, I'm 10 years younger than the middle one. That's funny. We have a lot of they similarities. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of similarities. I was the uh, youngest of four. Um, I was uh, born a Pisces a week before you. Um, uh, and it's just interesting. We, we both probably grew up in a very similar atmosphere of almost being the only child. Well, it, it definitely, I definitely have, when you talk about like birth order and stuff like that, I have some baby tendencies and then yeah. I also have only child tendencies. Um, and <laughs> I always it's say, a bad combo. Like, yeah, I'm like, it's like my parents, it's like my sister sometimes growing up kind of felt like stepsisters in a way, but we all have the same. It's like they had their family and then there was me, mom and dad. And then I would see my sisters, you know, occasionally. Uh, being in the country, you far away and removed and uh, yeah, you had friends and social life or everything, but you had to get creative within your own home, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I honestly didn't have too much of a social life. There wasn't a whole lot to do. And I feel, I feel like, um, and, and me and my, my friends, you know, we grew up, um, 
church youth group was like the big, the big thing of the week. You know, we'd go on Wednesdays and um, of course there was like basketball and I played softball and basketball. I took piano lessons and I was always in choir and stuff like that. So that was kind of my social life, not so much growing up and doing, doing things. I didn't, I, I didn't go to a party in high school. Um, not one I after, I guess after prom one year we went bowling after prom. And then one year we went over to a friend's house um, and just watched movies and then, but not ever like it's Friday night at so-and-so's house. Like it just kind of wasn't really like that. Oklahoma. I grew up in Tulsa. Um, it, it breeds an interesting group of people. And I, I always ask everybody that I talk to from Oklahoma, the same thing. Would you agree that hardheadedness is one of the key traits of an Okie? Uh, I think so, but in a good way. Yeah. You know, yeah not in a negative. People, people want to fight for things that are important to them. And, you know, you can, you can, you're stubborn because you believe in something, you know, it's not just stubborn for the sake of being stubborn. My husband might disagree, but I feel <laughs> like it's, it's for a reason. Sure. What the influence of your parents on you, uh, not just in that regard of uh, the oaky tendencies and traits, but where did the drive come from within you? I feel like I am a, I'm an observant person. I feel like that's kind of how I learn. I kind of sit back and watch other people and, um, I feel like growing up, I learned a lot from my parents just because I knew how they grew up and, um, you know, not neither one of them had any money in their family at all, you know, and, and definitely had to work for everything that they did have. And what they, I think, wanted more than anything was for us to not to to have more than they did, you know, yeah. for us to to not rely on food stamps and stuff like that, like my mom did. So I, I feel like that was a really important thing for them. And my mom, you know, put herself through college to be a teacher, which, you know, a mm -hmm. teacher in Oklahoma doesn't make anything. And it's, it's kind of a, a hard profession to say, I really want to do this. But, you know, she put herself through college and she worked her way through college and um, had me while she was going for her master's. And, oh, you wow. know, it was, it was kind of uh, – just some, some hard, uh, hurdles to jump through. Um, but she, she did it. And my dad worked hard his whole life and he worked at a paper mill and, um, kind of the same thing, you know, just wanting us to have, have more opportunities than they did. And I feel like my personality just in seeing that and respecting that and knowing that they were doing all they, all they could and why they were doing it was for us. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like helped, helped me, uh, learn, learn the value of hard work. Yeah. Well, you're living proof of it every day and every year we watch you do it. You have, that has not left you at all. Education, very important. Your mom's a teacher. So it was kind of built into you and it's something you didn't take lightly. You easily could have walked away after high school, after, uh, you know, it did really well in high school. You were a good, really good. You got great grades, very active. Like you said, sports and the arts and and everything. And you very easily could have just walked away from after high school and and pursued singing. But that you you would put that on the back burner. Well, I feel like you know, growing up, I I I knew that this was something that would be really awesome. <laughs> I love to sing. And I, as a kid, I mean, I really I annoyed everyone constantly just singing all the time. And, um, you know, it was, you know, my parents would take us to family reunions and stuff like that. And it's like dance monkey, you know, sing, sing for us, Gary. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I that's just what I love to do. And um, I remember as a kid, like knowing all the words to lots of songs. I look at my kids now and Isaiah's got that for sure. Like he knows all the words to lots of songs. And I'm like, OK, you know, I, but I'll, yeah. I'll see other kids that aren't like that at all. And I'm like, it was I don't know how my my brain remembered just lyrics and still does like it does. I can't yeah. do much else, but <laughs> I got that. Um, but yeah, I, I I just grew up singing, and um, I feel like in my observant nature, uh, I'm I'm also just a practical person, mm -hmm. and um, you know, you try to think of well, how would I get there? You know, how on earth would that happen? Um, I feel like the older I got, the more I was just like, well, you, you go to school and you get a degree. And my mom is a teacher. Both my sisters uh, are teachers. And 
um that's just what you do yeah uh so i i mean i definitely sang around like growing up in high school we like had a band we'd go sing in bars i sang it in car shows and um we would have like you know christmas specials and stuff like that where we'd rent out some theater somewhere and um we would play and uh, i was in various like theater country music branson style shows mm -hmm. kind of company groups and uh I, I would do that um either for my university or outside of it kind of all around oklahoma and um arkansas right across the border in like the fort smith area and even up into like wichita kansas we would we'd, we'd play and my mom would drive me and um was there was there with me. So I, I always knew I wanted to do this, but I feel like the older you get, you're just like, what makes me special? Like, that's not real. You know, it's like, Oh, I'm going to win the lottery. You know, <laughs> like what are the, I'm, I'm not going to go get a job because I think I'm going to win the lottery. Like, no, you're going to, you got to go get a job. So that's kind of how I thought of it. And you went to a uh, college Northeastern uh, Oklahoma uh, Tahlequah, which is home to the greatest chicken fried steak I've ever had in a Ooh. truck stop there in Tahlequah, which is, I love that town. Um, it, it still, we, we, you had already experienced one exit off of exit 209 by this point when you were 14. Yeah. Well, I, I first came to visit Nashville when I was like 10 years old and I 10 loved years old. it. Wow. Yeah. I was, I was a baby and, um, we had a friend who was one of she was she was kind of a friend of the family and she would push as well to like get me to sing places. Um, so I definitely had a lot of people in my life that were like, you're you're pretty good. Like, let's go. Let's go try. And, you know, you should sing here or sing in this you know theater thing. Go go here mm -hmm. and sing for these people. And um, so it was like getting connected through other people to do things. And we just came for a visit. And we visited like the Country Music Hall of Fame and uh, we we saw the Ryman. I didn't get to go in, um, but we we saw it and uh, I'm trying to think of what else we did while we were here. But it just kind of took it in. And I just thought I was, you know, big stuff going to going to see Nashville and uh, came back later uh, because, again, it was one of those things that it's like I can't even describe how it happened, but um, kind of had some. I uh, got to meet some people and record some songs and, um, you know, it was one of those, I feel like people at the time were looking for like another like Leanne Rhymes because she mm -hmm. had exploded and, um, you know, different people just trying to introduce us to people. Again, I, I don't even know how it happened, but I, I shook some hands. I met some people. <laughs> and uh, this is when you were 14 now? Yeah, yeah. And there was a potential record deal that you were you, you got somewhat close to at that time. Well, I don't know how close I got, but it was definitely, <laughs> you know, again, just meeting people and shaking hands. And um, I think people looking for for that next big thing. And uh, I was I was such a baby and I was just in awe and trying to not mess everything up and probably had no idea, you know, not probably. I had no idea what I was doing because I was a child. <laughs> but, but yeah, 14. I mean, we came home and it was always like, yeah, just waiting for that phone call, you know, just waiting. And um, obviously, I, I, I had no idea how things work or any any of that. So it was, you know, back in school and doing my thing and waiting for that phone call. <laughs> <laughs> and it never came. It never came, but you know what? I, I, I think back on that and I'm like, if something had happened, like there's no way I would have the the career I have now or, or probably just sense of normalcy. Like it, it was so important to, uh, it was it was important for me to go to school. It was important for me to kind of have that, that base. And, you know, if that had worked out, it would have been like some, flash in the pan i might have had like a song on the radio and thought i was big stuff and you probably never would have heard from me again um because yeah. there was a lot of growing up i had to do so yeah it was it was a good experience it was great to be able to be in a real recording studio and sing a little bit um and uh and kind of get get a taste of nashville um after that i, I feel like i knew i wanted to to live here i, I thought that would be amazing because I, I just loved i love nashville were you too green to be nervous on that first trip? 
Probably. Um, I remember at some point we did some like showcase at one of the the local like showcasing, you know, <laughs> bars, um, for lack of a better word. But a bluebird uh, type of place. Yeah. Yes, it was not the bluebird. But um, I remember being like, this is it, you know, and I think I was nervous for that. But um, I mean, obviously, again, it was like, why are we people are probably out there like, why are we watching this kid up on stage at a bar? <laughs> Do you remember what you sang? I don't. I don't. Uh, it was probably covers, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, just whatever the ladies was singing on the radio at the time. Gosh, so you go back to Oklahoma, which is a common story. We hear this from a lot of artists. It's like it takes more than one shot sometimes at this town to to figure this thing out. And, oh, and, sure. fig- and if I had had some kind of plan, if I had actually known <laughs> what I was doing, it probably would have been um, somewhat different. But I don't I don't ever remember feeling like disappointed or or anything. I mean, I, I thought it was fun and I got to go and sing in Nashville. And that was that was enough for me as a. Uh, a kid from, you know, Shakota, Oklahoma, I probably felt like I already made it big <laughs> if I got to do that. Do you think you would have been satisfied um, with the, knowing that you gave it at least that much of a shot? Um, I feel like I'm the kind of person that I, I, whatever I do, I, I'm going to be happy in it, you know? And I, 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 I have a lot of drive, but it's for, it's for the task at hand, Mm -hmm. whatever that is. So um, I honestly feel like God had to open the doors of American Idol for me to step through to say, this is what you're going to do. And then I could give it my all, you know, I wanted to sing, but nothing would have ever kept me from doing that. You know, you needed to be pulled into it. You needed to be pulled. I did. Because if I, if I had gone to school, I went to school for journalism. I wanted to work in TV somewhere. I still would have been singing at church on Sunday. I still would have been, you know, whatever doing, doing things like that and, and, and singing. Cause that's, that's what I love to do for me. I feel like it was less about like the lights and the TV stuff and the, that kind of stuff. I felt like it was more about just being able to sing and I I could do that anywhere, anytime. But even wanting to pursue a career in journalism and like uh, be it a anchor or reporter or broadcaster, or you still had that hunger to be in front of people. I feel like I always knew I was good with words. I I liked writing stories. Um, I I was always good at like reading teleprompters. I was always good at uh, writing for the school newspaper, stuff like that. I was good. I was good at that stuff. And I I knew that that gift was one that I had. And and that's that was what I wanted to pursue. Gosh. So then after or during your collegiate career, that door was kicked open. Where did that start? Where did do, was somebody suggesting that you audition? Was somebody demanding you audition? <laughs> somebody surprise you with an audition? Uh, well, that was season four was, was coming up. Um, so it was kind of, you know, the height of, of American Idol. And um, I was visiting home one weekend uh, from, from college um, Cause I, I stayed up there and, and did like the summer country music um, theater show. And uh, I came home and um, I saw on the news that they were uh, like sleeping outside on the sidewalks, getting ready to audition um, in like Ohio in like Cleveland or something. And um, I, uh, I was like, Oh, you know, they're having auditions again. Wonder where they're going to be. So I got on my parents' uh, dial-up internet, had to wait about 10 minutes for uh, the website to come up and see, and see where they were going to have um, auditions. And the closest, it was like all around the outside of the U.S. And then the closest one was like, there was like one in the middle, it was St. Louis. And uh, I, I asked mom where, how far is that? And uh, she was like, I don't know, like six, seven hour drive, something like that. And I was like, okay. Well, that was a weird question, right? Where's St. Louis? And uh, and my to a mom, teacher yeah, asking where St. Louis is like, to a teacher. She's like, "Why do you ask?" Yeah. And I said, "Oh, they're having American Idol auditions." Um, I mean, it was soon after; it wasn't that long after. And uh, she was like, "Okay." And then we both go about doing our things, and she comes back in and says, "If you want to go, I'll drive you." Awesome. And I I was like, "Ah, I'm stupid, no." 
no, like, what are the chances? And she's like, oh, just think about it. If you want to go, I'll drive you. So I said, okay. <laughs> and I, I talked another girl that was in our, you know, our, our company, our theater group into, into going with us. And like the next week or so we were in a car. I, I had to do one last, uh, one last show at, um, at the theater. And then we got in the car and mom drove through the night. We stopped at a McDonald's gas station, changed our clothes. Um, and we were, because we had to drive all night and we didn't sleep outside on the sidewalk, we were the last group to, uh, to get audition. And I think there were like 7,500, like between 7,800, 8,000 people um, auditioning there. So wow. we were the last group to go in. I was like, why are we here? Like, they've been listening to people all day long. They don't want to listen to no more people. They're just going to say no, go home so we can go home. But they took you. They did. And did that shock you? Um. Yeah. I mean, I had listened all day long. We sat there literally for eight hours um, in the stadium and uh, at the time, the Rams stadium. Mm -hmm. And um, we sat there for eight hours and for eight hours listening to seven to eight thousand people singing. You walk out in the corridor to go to the bathroom. There's like people like warming up, you know, over singing to the wall. And there was just people singing everywhere. And there were a lot of really good people. I, I'd hear people. I'd be like, oh, my gosh, like she's she's better than I am. He's better than I am. Like, <laughs> why are we here again? <laughs> I probably asked that question a thousand times that day. And um, and walked up and, you know, they kind of had us in lines and somebody over here sang. And then they were like, you go. I started singing. And then um, there were two guys and one looked at the other one and said, what do you think? And he was like her. Like, go, go to the room, go to the special yeah. room. And, uh, I think I screamed. I, think I, was, I let out a, a squeal. Like, I feel like everybody around me knew that I was going to the special room. That is amazing. That had to have felt wild, especially after, um, I don't want to say you were doubting yourself, but to, but to ask so many times, why are we here? Um, was there a sense of doubt or was it just a sense of this was just too overwhelming of a chance? It was that lottery thing, right? Mm -hmm. It was like all these people trying to play the lottery too, you know, and this <laughs> is just one, one city out of a lot of cities. So there are many more just like that, if not even more people trying out. Um, so it was that just the whole time, you know, we yeah. were all trying to, to hit the jackpot. <laughs> Uh, we, we can go through this whole set, but you've, you've done so many interviews about the process of, of, of American Idol. I don't want to jump over it, but at the same time, I want to get a, a little sense of where you were as a person during that time. I mean, we, was there a, a, was it a blur, the whole thing a blur? Or was it uh, was there a moment where you just said, oh, I get what's happening? It was a blur. It was a blur. Like even thinking back now, it's still I, I feel like I'm still trying to make sense of it. Um, you know, trying out and singing in front of the judges. And at the time that was, you know, Simon, Paula and Randy, it was like the, the OGs judges. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was, it was that. And then like getting a call back and then they're like, Hey, we want to come to your hometown and, and film you. And I'm like, well, that has to mean something. Right. And they put me on the, um, on one of the commercials. Um, mm -hmm. So it was like, I'm still going to school during this time. I'm 21 years old. I'm still going to, to classes. And yet people are like, I saw your commercial. I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, this is good. This is good, right? This has to mean something. Somebody somewhere thought that was a good reason to pull people into the show. Wow. Um, and next thing you know, I'm on a plane to L.A. by myself. And I had never flown anywhere before, I'd never been on a plane. We didn't. We, we, we took like one family vacation ever. Wow. We drove, you know, so it wasn't, it's not like I, I had a lot of experience traveling, especially on my own and to, to be like wandering around an airport alone for trying to catch my connecting flight, like asking people, can you help me? I don't was, know. Where was that almost more intimidating than what you were going there to do? Probably. Um, I mean, just getting there and, and I missed, I missed my connecting flight. You know what I mean? So then you get there and I'm like, they're going to, I'm too much trouble. They're going <laughs> to kick me off the show for 
not knowing how the world works. And uh, in the end, I honestly feel like that maybe became part of my appeal. I feel like people were like, oh, like, look at this, look at this poor little girl. Show her. She's so naive. She doesn't know anything. And she's in LA. And yeah, I was, it, it, and each week was, you know, horrifying. It was terrifying to get on stage imagine. and you're trying to figure out what to sing and they you know tell you how important song choice is but then you're like there's a bazillion songs in the world like what what would make me stand out or you overthink it and I feel like at the end of the day I just started picking songs I liked and <laughs> We all know that the voters uh, fell in love with you instantly. I mean, talking to the producers of the show and anybody who knows the show and your history on it. I mean, you were the front runner from day one on season four and you just stayed that way. And, and, and no offense to the rest of your competition, but there wasn't a chance, really. I mean, you were going to win this thing. Do you remember looking at the judges one time in particular and just seeing maybe a twinkle in their eye or a spark that just said, oh, my, this this could happen? I mean, I feel like the the week I, I sang Alone by Heart, you know, was definitely like that week. Um, and that wasn't even I don't even think we were in top 10 yet. You know, we were we were hovering around there. Uh, but it's like each each time I had my goals. Right. You wanted to make the top 24 because that was when you got to go to the live shows. And then after that, for us, you wanted to make a top 12 because we were told that the top 12 were going to make this like album and uh, which. <laughs> was super cool and then the top 10 we're gonna get to go on tour so it was like each each time and then once once i got that i was like this is amazing um you're gonna go on tour and, by the, and then when i get kicked off i can have enough money to go back and finish school and you know maybe have some kind of start in life um yeah. but that, that was always like my goals you know these little mini goals but that week was like when and, and it I mean, I feel like it kind of put a, put a target on my back too, right? Because yeah. it was like, oh, you know, you're you're the front runner, you know, Simon saying all of this stuff. And we, we still had a long way to go in the show. Um, and then I was like, man, I hope that doesn't make people stop voting. voting. You know, I hope it hope it helps me, not hurts me. And sure. Uh, but then I made top 10. I felt good. <laughs> Back up in just a couple of steps. When you're still going to school and doing the audition process and you're now in the commercials for, for the upcoming season, what was the support or lack of support from your classmates at, uh, at your college? I mean, I feel like all my friends and stuff were super supportive, you know. Um, it's kind of one of those things that, again, like – there, there was probably some naysayers, you know, that Carrie thinks she's going to win kind of thing. But um, I feel like I felt more supported than anything. And then when I went and had to had to drop out, there's a there's a certain day, you know, you have to drop your classes. Or you're going to have to pay for them. And uh, yeah. when it looked like I was I was still in the game, um, that day came and I had to go drop. And the lady who was sitting at the desk was like, does this mean you made it to the next round? <laughs> I was like, I can't legally can't talk tell. about it because we're not supposed to, but I just need my money back. <laughs> I don't That's have awesome. any money and I need that money back. No kidding. And so you take your first flight ever out to L.A. for American Idol. The next time you take a plane, it's a private jet. <laughs> yeah. Basically. I it, it was it was a, such a weird um, a weird time, you know, and we were by like February, um, you know, living in L.A. and uh, we always had roommates. They like put us up in apartments and um, it was just such a weird, a weird time. But we also were very sheltered there, too. We did live in a bubble and we would go to the studio every week and we there was a few hundred members in the yeah. in the audience and um Every week, you know, I probably convinced myself I was going home. This is the week. This is the week. Yep. Yep. This is the week. Uh huh. Especially Why are we here, bug? It's, it yeah. just never left you. <laughs> I feel like it's, you know, you, I don't want to set my expectations too high. You know, I, I want to give it my all and do my best and, you know, roll with the punches. But um, yeah, the closer we started inching towards the end and every week we were saying goodbye to people and, um, it was like I'm still I'm still in this thing, you know, about the top three. It was like, oh my gosh, we're at the top three. And then the top two and the finale was such a 
big to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like a multi night finale. And they had all these people coming in to like sing with us and perform with us. And I'm going to places and um, they're, you know, giving me dresses to try on and I'm picking things out. And, um, you know, that was a whole other thing. Like during during the show, you know, they're trying to get us to to look our best and stuff like yeah. that. And we would go shopping with the uh, the stylists and they'd hold up, you know, $400 pair of shoes. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I, I don't have $400. I have I have $400 to spend on all my clothes yeah. this, for this whole thing. Like, I, no, I can't use my credit card. It's like I got a $50 limit. <laughs> I use that for gas. <laughs> Did you, you had to buy your clothes? Uh, yeah, we, we got we got some a uh, little bit of money. But at the time, again, this is when it was like at the height of American Idol. There were like three days a week for a while where we were on TV. It was like the girls sing and then the guys sing and then we yeah. have like an elimination night. So I need three outfits. I was like, we're going to I'm going to use one of my pair of jeans. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's looking at my shoes, so I'm fine. I got this top at, you know, so we were we were. We were shopping the thrift stores in L.A. It's amazing. I didn't know that part. Um, you win. You win season four of American Idol. And just when you thought the the blur would slow down, it actually sped up. For sure. Um, we we went home for a couple days after the finale, which was, I mean, just one of the most magical nights of my life. You know, it's still it's still hard to top that feeling and that that night and the confetti falling. And it's like I still have all these pictures in my head that are just beautiful and wonderful. I'm going to get teary eyed, but we went home for a couple weeks after that. And then it was off to, um, our tour for the, for the idol tour. And we went to like 50 something cities, you know, and it was like my first, you know, my first tour life, uh, experience. And we were singing in front of thousands and thousands of people, um, every night. And, you know, it was this big, people would sing together and it was a show and it was lights and it was fun. It's big, big, but you trained for this your whole life. I mean, the, the misconception I think for a lot of people, maybe still to this day is that, Oh, look, American Idol birthed Carrie Underwood, which it was a good boost, but I mean, you put a lifetime of work into this. It, it was definitely, you know, I, I sang at all kinds of places um, in front of people, in front of no one, you know, and, and everything in between, um, yeah. you know, as a as a kid. And I do feel like I learned a lot and um, feel like I got I remember one of the vocal coaches on Idol was like, this is star boot camp. Like you were you were learning a whole lot and being exposed to a whole lot in a very short period of time. And that's how the tour was as well. You know, yeah. it's like sink or swim figure out how to sleep on a bus, you know, get your luggage off the bus at 3 a.m. Cause that's what time we were rolling up in places. Yeah. Um, just figure it out. And uh, I, I feel like I, again, my personality being a, you know, sit back and watch kind of thing. Um, just trying to learn as much as I could. Cause I, I was still waiting. I, I was loving every second of it, but I'm again, a practical person. And I'm like, well, this is going to be over someday, you know? <laughs> Uh, and then we started making the album in the middle of the tour and like yeah. doing photo shoots and stuff like that. And, you know, we'd be in cities where we'd have a day off and I'd be recording Jesus Take the Wheel in, in some studio somewhere, you know. So it was uh, it was wow. such an interesting experience, um, just juggling all of it and just figuring all of it out. I don't know if this was uh, close to the next time you took that exit off of 209 in Nashville uh, around this time. Uh, you're probably back and forth a few times during that year of the tour. But at the same time, I remember the first time I met you and that was at Fanfare CMA Music Fest after the year you won. And I remember the buzz as you b- blazed into this room, into that convention hall and Every single head turned because everybody knew Carrie Underwood. We'd watched you on television. We'd supported you. We'd rooted you on. And now you came into Nashville on the heels of this huge confetti flying victory from uh, American Idol. And were you obviously proud of your accomplishment? Was, but was, was there also a whole new level of intimidation? I feel like I was too naive to understand. 
I was such a deer in the headlights, you know, and I was I was going to Nashville again. That was that was kind of how I looked at it. And um, I, I got to come to a fanfare when I was growing up, um, when I was on one of those, you know, recording trips when I was 14. And I got to see it on that side of things. And um, it was just so so fun to think now now people want my autograph you know now they want to take pictures with me like this yeah. is it's so weird i went to the opry um for the first time got to sing on the opry stage and that was just like how is this my life and it i mean it did it happened so fast um sure. and and again i wouldn't say i was scared um Good. if anything i was just like the kid in a candy store excited and uh, met a whole lot of people um, that week and, you know, shaking hands. And it's like, these are, these are your family that you're going to be working with for who knows how long. And, um, I was just excited to be there. Um, again, not your typical path to uh, where you are right now as arguably the most successful female country artist this format has ever seen, but it, it, a lot of people have the stories of scraping together and, and finding odd jobs in Nashville until they get their shot. You came in, shot out of a gun. I mean, so it was a little bit of a different path, but what was the Nashville like that you came into? What were your spots? Where did you hang around? What, what, what places did you go to do? What was, what was life like in the early years of your residence in Nashville? Well, I mean, that's, that's part of it too. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody here, you know? Um, I, uh, we lived in a, after the, all the American Idol tour stuff was over. And then it was like, here we are in Nashville. You know, I had, uh, um, my, my album come out and, um, I'm singing, uh, Jesus take the wheel on the CMA awards and, um, just all of that stuff. It was such a crazy time. Um, I, I didn't go anywhere. I didn't do anything, uh, except work. I didn't know anybody wasn't, wasn't hanging out with people. Um, I was lucky. I, I met my still hair and makeup artist, uh, Melissa Sliker, um, at, at, you know, one of my first times, you know, singing in, in Nashville. And, um, I was lucky enough to kind of, I feel like be introduced to a lot of people that are still in my life now. And I, I feel like that was God just looking out for me and just putting really solid people in, in my life and in my path. Um, but yeah, I didn't go places. I didn't do things <laughs> <laughs> but, out by myself. You had a crew around you now. That's fortunate. A team. You got to have a team around you. But who's the first Nashville friend besides Melissa? Um, Chris Oglesby was somebody that I feel like was in my life immediately. And he he's done a lot, you know, in the song publishing, managed songwriter management side. He's done done a lot of stuff and and you know we we met him early on and worked with him a lot and um he he introduced us to people and and it was like okay we can trust this guy now who does he trust you know who is this right. stamp was gold you know if he's like these are the people that are amazing um we you could believe him you know so i feel yeah. like that that was somebody that you know was was great being around um professionally and personally what part of town did you live in first in Nashville? Uh, we lived at the Lowe's <laughs> over <laughs> on, uh, I guess it was the Lowe's Vanderbilt. Yeah. I went from my apartment in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, that was like 350 bucks a month, um, yeah. you know, working, working at the pizza place or at the vet clinic or wherever I needed to work to, you know, pay my rent. Um but then, you know, it was like, I'm going to buy a house in a neighborhood. Like, this is insane. And I was, you know, 20, 22, 23 years old. Did so, your neighbors know who you were? Yeah. And that's why I had to move. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was such a great, oh, I love that house so much. And I love that neighborhood so much. And just as things grew, you just never know how things are going to end. And my alarm was like going off quite a bit mm -hmm. and I had to call the police once and it's fine. It was all nothing, but um, I was like, I feel like God's telling me to move. So uh, I, I found a, a place soon after that was a little more secure. <laughs> <laughs> how does, how does one prepare for super startup? There's, I always say that you hear people critique people in your shoes for, for mostly out of jealousy sake. And they'll just say, well, you know, that person, blah, blah, blah. That's, 
how how can you possibly critique someone when you can't stand in their shoes? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's like how do you prepare for it and how do you deal with it? I don't think there is a, a preparing for it, but I do think there is a dealing dealing with it, and I think that is if you're going to be successful at you know living a life like this, I feel like you have to have a really firm foundation. I think that's the most important thing. Um, I, I grew up in church. I have an amazing family that are solid um, and that support me and that, you know, they don't love me anymore because of what I do. It, 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 you know, my, my mom and dad are still my mom and dad and they'll still admonish me and wag a finger at me if I'm doing something that they don't approve of because they're my parents. So I feel like having those people in my life who just treated me the same um, and I feel like having a, a foundation and an identity that isn't wrapped up in what I do is, uh, is important. So there, there's no preparation, but if you, if you put your whole identity into your stardom, at some point you're going to be very hurt and very disappointed. So I you'll burn like, out like a star, you'll yeah. burn out like a star. Yeah. That's, that's, like it's, it's, you have to have a higher, higher purpose and a, and a higher, um, I don't know, just have your, have your heart be dependent on something else. Finding a church in Nashville early on had to been one of your, one of your top priorities. It was hard. I bounced around for a really long time and um, it was hard finding a place that I, I felt like, you know, I could just go to church and worship with everybody. And, um, but I, I've, I've met a lot of people along the way, you know, that, um, we're, we're like-minded and especially now that I'm a little bit older and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to church by myself. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's good to, to have a, a community that, you know, you can, you can go and, and feel like you're a part of and not people are looking at you. Which is exactly where I was going to go next. Feeling a part of Nashville, feeling a part of the community. I mean, that's that's a, an amazing feeling, and it's comforting, and it's it, it's there's a fam- familial embrace that comes with this town if you let it, and if they let you in, and that's that's got to be one of the greatest senses of pride and and an honor at the same time. Definitely. I mean, I feel like how I came into it, there were definitely some, um, you know, what. What, what's this girl about? Right. I, I was, I was on this show that was primarily a pop, a pop music producer, you know, and, um, it, it was, it was definitely wanting to, I wanted to be a part of the community. That's why we came to that CMA music fest. It was like, this is where we need to plant our stakes because this is where I want to be. Yeah. Um, but then rolling up in it was like, oh, okay, these people don't know me me you know i i'm not a member of the family automatically and um i feel like i i noticed that and i felt that and you know could could almost use that maybe as fuel Mm -hmm. Um, i wanted to prove myself i wanted people to know that i I, my heart was here and always has been um and and just wanted to to use it to prove myself every chance i could get i still i still do that you know i've uh, probably there's probably a lot of people now that are like, oh, you were on American Idol because <laughs> you know, it was a long time ago. Right. Um, but uh, I I still always want to prove myself. You do. And it's uh, and, you, and you continue to do so. I mean, Jesus, take the wheel. Uh, your first single is always the most important. And when the to, to feel that reception of this song and the connection of this song and the, the fact that some hearts broke nearly every record and still hold a lot of them. Uh, as far as top selling albums for a solo female artist, uh, best selling, fastest selling, all these all these stats that came with some hearts and the success of Before He Cheats and, and uh, Jesus Take the Wheel. You couldn't have had a better second step of this career. I mean, some people can stumble off of American Idol or The Voice or whatever and, and never, never regain their footing. It just continued. I mean, it, this was you had the right choice of song, the right choice of message. And it was a risk. Well, I didn't think of it that way. You know what I mean? Like I heard the song and I love the song. And it, was, it wasn't until afterwards when people started telling me like that was kind of a risky move to be singing songs about Jesus for your <laughs> for your first single. And I mean, I, I didn't think of it that way. You know, that's isn't that what country music's about? You know, you come in and, and you kind of put yourself out there and you pick songs that resonate with you. You write songs that are your heart, your story that you're trying to tell. Um, and that, that's obviously, I mean, it's a big part of, of me and who I am. And, 
um, on, on the flip side of that before he cheats. I mean, that's also me, you know, I feel like that was, that was the riskier move to me. You know, we, we have like, Jesus take the wheel. Don't forget to remember me. We're like singing these sweet songs. And then, um, and then we, we sing something that's a bit more aggressive. That's me too. I like, I like getting sassy. <laughs> I've seen it. I've seen it. Um, So uh, I remember the music video for uh, Don't Forget to Remember Me. Your mom was on that set and the the video. And I love being on that set and watching that relationship. And and really what you just talked about, about staying grounded and having a good foundation and to see that relationship between you and your mother. And it's still just as strong. I mean, is it just it's invaluable? Oh, it is. And and like I said, the fact that they still treat me like their daughter and not like their famous daughter, you know, it's it means everything. I talked to my mom at least five days a week, you know, um, yeah. in, in the mornings when I'm like putting my makeup on, uh, it's just, that's kind of our time. And, um, yeah, they're, they're just still, they're still there. They're still there for me. They're still that rock and I can talk to them about anything. And, you know, now they're grandparents. They are, they were before <laughs> that, that happens when your sister, your siblings are older. My, my mom was a, a grandparent when I was like five years old. So, <laughs> <laughs> You're like, ah, oh, another grandchild. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, looking at Nashville as a home, um, any thoughts? I asked you to paint the picture of Shakota. Uh, can you paint the picture of Nashville? What does it mean to you? I love it so much. I love the people here. I love, obviously, you know, the this is where you go if you want to be a country singer, period. Um, I feel like there's not really any other genre of music that kind of kind of has had that for that long you know you'd find little pockets of you know the seattle grunge scene or like stuff in atlanta you know it's it's like you have these little pockets for a minute but nashville is like really held strong and um i love living here i love that my kids get to grow up here you know my my husband when we first met and we first kind of started dating i'm like do you like Nashville? Because I mean, if this is going to go anywhere, like you better like it, you know, because I, I wasn't going anywhere. So. No, you, moving to Ottawa, I don't think was quite on the top of your priority list at that time. It was nice to watch him play there, but it is cold there. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Fisher then becomes a Nashville predator and uh, boy, talk about pieces falling into place again. It's just the it was way it was supposed to work out. And I mean, I I keep saying that, that it's like, you know, God opened that door for me to go um, audition for Idol and put so many incredible people in my life that are still with me today. These songs that, you know, as you were saying, um, really planted my path here Mm -hmm. and um, and gave me just the most incredible start where we're sent to us, given to us, placed in my life. Um, I meet my husband who gets randomly traded to Nashville. He could have been traded to 28 other teams at the time, you know, Um, but he was traded to Nashville, Tennessee, where I already lived. Um, It was just, you know, nobody will ever believe that. I, I promise you, we, we had nothing to do with it. I think they, I think his, because Mike is such a nice guy. Um, I think they were nice enough from all the offers that they had. One was from Nashville and they were like, "Mm, let's, let's let him go live with his wife. (laughs) Um, So I I think it was that, but it was, it was just all of these blessings that, you know, have really, have really lined up and I take credit for absolutely none of it. Yeah. It's fantastic. I mean, if you see that that same why are we here kind of mentality every time you take to a podium to accept an award over a hundred of them now. And each time you say, uh, pick one up for a second or third or 27th time, you say the same thing. You're like, how is this happening? You still second guess it. It's just I'm just blessed beyond measure. I, every single day I have moments like that, even in my my normal life. You know, we, we have a farm outside of Nashville and um Sometimes I'll just, you know, look at the sky and look at the trees and I'm just like, I live here. This is my life. Like, look at my incredible sons. You know, this is my, I'm I can't believe how blessed I am. God, it's so fantastic. We're going to wrap things up with a little thing I call HLRP. It's highest, lowest, regret and pride. And it's just free association thinking. It's just uh, after everything we've talked about and everything you've gone through since um, uh, in your life, your personal life, your career, uh, the highest point you can think of. 
<clears throat> is this all career related? No, it's whatever it- you want. What does the word highest mean to you? What is it? What is the highest moment? The I loftiest mean, my, moment. My family is is definitely, you know, I feel like I have I have glimpses of highest every single day. I, I look at them and how how my boys grow and how just smart and sweet they are and their kind hearts and like that is that's that's the legacy stuff, you know. That's the stuff that you are gonna leave behind and. Yeah. I just, I pray for them that they'll just do big, amazing things in the world. Perfect answer. The lowest point. It's a tough question. Um, golly, it's, it's hard to look back on, on lows because something good always came out of it. Great answer. Uh, so it's, it's hard to just pick, pick something. I feel like 2018 was a hard year just mm-hmm. in personal struggles. Um, but it's also the year that, you know, we wrote and, and made, the cry pretty album, you know, and, and so much good came out of that. And it was a, it was a hard time, but I feel like I learned to lean, to lean on the people around me more and, you know, and lean on God more and just make some music that I really loved out of it. That's great. I love that perspective. Um, any regrets? <sighs> no, uh, I, I feel like, I'm I'm not great at living in the moment. I, I wish I could go back and and really um really enjoy some of those some of those peaks a little more um and and take pictures and just be be super present. Um, if I could go back, maybe I don't know, just just be more present in in some of those moments. Yeah, that's good I, advice I, for anybody. Yeah. That's great advice for anybody. And the last question, you kind of answered it with the highest point being your family, your greatest sense of pride. Uh, definitely, you know, my my family. I, I, I do feel like some of the stuff I've been just working on, I feel like is is more legacy things. It's not just about like, um, you know, hoping for that immediate success or the number one or the, you know, sales or whatever. Um I have this incredible family, my boys, and I, I do feel like the like gospel stuff that I've been working on is is that legacy stuff that it's like this is this is what it's all about. And this is just making music that you love and something you believe in just because you love it and just because you believe in it. And there's a, a big freedom in that as well and not not thinking about the success that could or could not happen out of it. That is fantastic. Carrie Underwood, welcome to Exit 209. Thanks for taking us uh, on that journey of your exit, multiple exits off of 209. Uh, after this chat, I hope you don't look at that exit the same way. I will not. I'm glad I, uh, glad I took it. <laughs> Thanks for spending the time with us. This has been fantastic. 